Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at the newly released King's Bounty 2. I've been excited for this game for quite some time now. It's an RPG with tactical battles, so it's pretty much right up my alley, and I made it an easy pick as one of my most anticipated games of the year. Thanks to the developers sending me a review key, I've been able to check the game out and prepare this review. Now, if after watching the review you decide you want to grab the game for yourself, you can do so at the link I've included in the description and pinned comment down below to support the channel as you buy. But first, let's see if King's Bounty 2 is worth the price of admission. In King's Bounty 2, you play as one of three characters, each with their own specializations, starting with a head start in one way or another depending on who you pick. As you go about questing and following the main as well as side plots of the game, you'll find yourself participating in the usual slew of RPG activities, gaining XP, leveling up, spending skill points, and engaging in encounters both social and physical. Many of these quests you take on will have multiple angles of tackling them, and each of these angles corresponds to one of four alignments. Order, Anarchy, Power, and Finesse. These also line up with your choices for spending skill points, where each of the four categories aren't just ways of thematically organizing what benefits you can take advantage of, but are actually ways of funneling your character down a path of development based on the choices you make. See, you have to accrue higher levels in each of the four categories individually to gain access to the higher level skills for said category, but doing so will actually lock you out from the opposite category's skills. It's an interesting idea and a neat spin on character development based on player actions. Now, these four categories also line up with units that you can recruit to fight battles for you, where each unit has a classification of their own and they either work well together or cause each other debuffs when fighting on the same battlefield, but more on battles in a bit. Starting inside a jail cell where you've been placed for suspicions, I believe, of poisoning the king, you find yourself freed on the prince's orders, and your first task is to meet with him and get a quick rundown on what's up. There's a growing evil across the land, and you need to investigate it. What's more, you've supposedly been prophesized to be the one. Not everybody is necessarily on board with whatever that means, but hey, hopefully it'll help you tackle whatever this growing evil is. It's a fairly stereotypical plotline as far as RPG plotlines are concerned, but that's not the least of our troubles here. We'll get into those in a bit. Now, apart from seeking out quest givers or chasing after the glaringly obvious interactive items, you'll find yourself buying and selling equipment and junk that helps you improve your stats in various ways or otherwise helps you acquire wealth with which to buy more equipment or recruit units. Perhaps one of the most interesting elements of King's Bounty 2 is in that latter bit, where your character themselves aren't just the heroes of the story, but they're leaders in more ways than one. When combat begins, the units you've selected for it fan out across a hex-based battlefield, situated where the combat actually began in the real world, or in the larger scope of the world, I should say, and then you take on your enemy in turn-based tactical combat, where movement points, action points, counter-attack management, and special unit abilities all come into play. Units, of which there are a great variety, are made up of multiple individuals, and each unit can have a maximum number based on the unit type itself, but your own leadership stat determines how big each individual unit can be. With individual entities within units, you can bet that the survival or loss of these individual entities makes a difference over the course of combat, and units that have even one entity survive can be healed up to full strength with some cost of gold, but those that lose every individual in them are lost forever, and you'll need to recruit their replacements at appropriate merchants. In this way, King's Bounty 2 can be quite challenging. A misstep or two and the next thing you know you've lost a solid unit or you've perhaps lost the battle as a whole. Now I quite like this level of challenging personally, so the battles really did it for me, but the fighting isn't necessarily perfect either. Things like environmental effects or the use of terrain aren't nearly as important as promised by the marketing. You know, high ground gives a slight advantage when you get the chance to use it, and while line of sight matters for ranged attacks, cover is so easily walked around that it's basically irrelevant. But as I was saying earlier, the units all belong to one of the four aforementioned categories, and unless you have the appropriate skills unlocked, they're not likely to get along and instead might hurt each other's morale, making your overall army weaker. With that said, 
Mixing and matching between the four categories allows for more flexibility on the battlefield, as each of these categories seems to fall into specializations of what they do best. You're always able to recruit more units than you can field at a time, swapping in reserves as needed, and this creates a fun bit of management when coupled with the fact that you can actually see what enemies you'll be battling before the engagement begins, allowing you to prepare your actual fighting force accordingly. For example, if you're up against a bunch of skeletons, you might not want to take as many archers. If you're up against, you know, magic resistance, then you don't want to take as many mages, etc, etc. It seems relatively simple, but it is an added layer that was quite enjoyable over the course of the game. Now, apart from the overall positive experience with the combat, it is a little unfortunate that your character is actually not directly involved. Now, you might say that this is how King's Bounty has always done it. Fact of the matter is, in a creative environment, one of the worst things you can say is, well, this is how we've always done it. Things change. Game design changes. What's fun changes. And I'm sure there are diehard fans who will stick by the old way of doing things. But for me personally, it created some very strange situations. You might walk around with a crossbow or a sword, but you're not a character on the hex grid that'll actually be shooting or swinging it. You stand to the sidelines with your stats helping buff your units and your abilities that you can use to affect the battle, but beyond that, it doesn't actually feel like you're involved, and it rather breaks the characters who are supposed to be warriors. Wouldn't they be fighting? And that's not the biggest cause for concern here either. King's Bounty 2 is best described as a janky game. Your character controls like a tank, moving in one of two speeds, neither of which I could describe as going. You can walk, or you can half-heartedly jog. You can't jump and you're glued to the ground, and the collision meshes in the environment will stop you from hopping off a curb more often than not, preventing you from even cutting corners at your slow pace, making for a very jarring experience. But hey, that's fine, let's call the horse over. Clearly the game's intent is to make the horse more integral, right? Except <laughs> I'm not sure if the horse actually moves much faster and it definitely controls much worse. WASD is the way to go for sure, but S should not mean do a U-turn and head back. S means slow down and if you're at a stop, start trotting backwards. Horses can move backwards. They can also gallop, but not your horse. Your horse barely canters, it, it trots. It barely squeezes through certain turns and you hardly get the feeling of charging to the world's rescue. You're more ambling to it. In a game where traversal plays a key role, the traversal does not feel good and the experience of getting from point A to point B was constantly grating. But let's move on from this topic. Conversations are all linear. You're spoken to, and your character speaks back, and yes, it's all voice acted, but not particularly well. The constant quips from the protagonist when doing the simplest of things is also off-putting, as you just seem like somebody who needs to pep themselves up every time they find a quest item or something. And while, you know, Geralt saying it looks like it might rain while standing in the middle of a storm isn't perfect, the good voice acting there makes it okay, whereas here you just kind of wish your character would stop talking for a few minutes, if only to spare you from the largely mediocre writing, though, you know, there are a couple of good moments here and there, I will give it that. Puzzle elements are a little too easy and simple, and there's a lot of backtracking involved more often than not, and if you heard my ramblings about movement speeds, you'll be able to piece together what the key problem is there. I'm also not the biggest fan of combat scenarios being clearly marked, but I understand this is definitely a subjective matter. I like my engagements to be a lot more fluid and organic. There's something very immersion breaking looking into the glowing ring and seeing my enemies face me, but not actually do anything about my presence. The need for the trigger is a byproduct of the turn-based, hex-based combat, I understand, but why not have, you know, potential threats appear similar to the player character? one entity that you need to either engage or run away from that represents an army. Or add another layer here, using the traversal as a way to get an advantage, you know, sneak off to the side and pick the enemy off one by one rather than engaging them head on and having to fight a full, you know, five on five or whatever size battle. But no, there are no rewards to that kind of lateral thinking, none that I saw at least, and more often than not, there was just a straight up roadblock. The giant glowing circle would take up the entire path and you had to fight the fight. There was no way to go around it. There was no 
choice. So while you hem and haw and amble from cutscene to cutscene and waypoint to waypoint, you'll find yourself often forced to engage in a battle, and should that battle prove too challenging, you'll need to take on more side quests or otherwise acquire some wealth with which to get more units, or perhaps purchase some equipment which will help you win said battle. Equipment in this game works a little differently from your typical RPG, again because your character is standing in the sidelines, the sword you're not swinging doesn't directly do more or less damage, but it helps your soldiers do more or less damage, and various equipment will reduce the cost of casting spells, it will help you know strengthen your unit's attack or defensive capabilities. You don't actually get to use the equipment yourself per se, but it does all stack up, you do get buffs and debuffs and all that kind of stuff, so there is a fun bit of inventory management. But honestly, the game sometimes is the very definition of getting a toy and then not being allowed to play with it. Why get an epic sword if you're never going to be allowed to swing it? But I digress. Audiovisually, the game looks like it could use some love. While some characters are surprisingly detailed and some environments are lush and beautiful, by and large, things feel like they've been plucked out of a previous era of game development. The protagonists don't look that great in action, with most NPCs actually being much higher fidelity, and the occasional vista you come across is quickly marred by a low-res texture from the PlayStation 2 port of the game. And though I kid about the PlayStation 2, much of the game was clearly built with consoles in mind. The menu design is... And I try not to use this word very often, but the menu design is abhorrent. While the menu and pop-up aesthetics are okay if I ignore the typography, the actual experience of using the interface is infuriating to the point that I don't even know which issue to highlight first. WASD to move around, E to read a note. Done reading the note? You need to press escape. Or click on the word escape to close the pop-up. Why can't you just press spacebar or E again? Your hand is already over those keys. Why do I have to lift my hand and shift over to the escape key? Anyway, you want to buy a unit from a merchant? Cool. Select it and press spacebar to buy, but you maybe want to look at the stat details, especially if you just started playing the game. All right, cool. Very easy. Happy? All right, now let's press spacebar to buy. Except no. You either have to press the button to switch back to unit selection and then press spacebar, or click on the same unit again and then press spacebar to buy. What? Tooltips are constantly either getting in the way or non-existent. There's no in-between. And in the middle of battle, you have to open a whole separate window to see details that countless other games have made easily visible and legible right on the battle screen. All this might sound negligible or easily ignored to some, but for a game that was already hard enough to gain any momentum in, thanks to the aforementioned tank-like controls and ambling pace of walking, having the menus be cumbersome to navigate only added to the feeling of trudging through mud. Just let me play the game. Just let me make progress. Just let me get to the next bland, tropey conversation so I can get my next cue that lets me fight a battle where my character stands to the side as my minions do my bidding, whether I'm a capable warrior or not. Frankly, my excitement for King's Bounty 2 came to a grinding halt very quickly. It was a struggle to get past even the prologue of the game, mired as it was by the horrors of traversal and just poor voice acting and writing and interactions in general. Battles and army management are fun, but maybe I only feel that way because they're a welcome escape from everything else the game has to offer. I find it very difficult to recommend King's Bounty 2 unless it's on a massive sale. Like, damn, I feel really mean saying this, but it is nowhere near a $50 game. Maybe 20 bucks at most, and at that price? At that price, I'd suggest waiting for a sale. So, it's... Don't even buy it at 20 bucks is what I'm saying. I can only mourn how much of the budget went into creating all these RPG elements that were never really engaging and never really invited much role playing either. There is no RP in this RPG. I understand playing as a preset character with motivations and opinions and all that, but even then, there should be room for the player to inflect their own self on said character through key decision making opportunities, of which there are only a few in King's Bounty 2. You should always have an opportunity to make the character your own as the player, to engage with the world through the lens of this joint identity. 
but now I'm just looking at warts on a toad. I hope this review of King's Bounty 2 gives you some insight on the game and helps you make a purchasing decision. Again, if you'd like to grab the game, you can do so at my link I've included in the description and pinned comment down below to support the channel as you do. I'm really quite bummed about King's Bounty 2. I really wanted to like the game, but I guess we don't always get what we want. Let me know your thoughts. If you decide to grab the game for yourself, I am curious to see what others think about it as always. Now, if you're interested in more strategy, management, and role-playing game-related news, reviews, previews, and more, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel. And as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.